The Nature of Rationalism from A Beginner's History of Philosophy by Herbert Cushman, 1911 Although the new science grew apace, it was not altogether a safe vocation. Natural science involves metaphysical questions at every point. The scientist at this time, therefore, found himself often in delicate relations with the jealous church guardians. A scientific explanation of the universe might antagonize the church dogma concerning God, creation, and the final outcome of the world. The church doctrine concerning the soul, too, its nature and its immortality, its relation to the body, might be antagonized by physiological and psychological discussions. In such dilemmas, as these the natural scientist was not successful in pre pretending to isolate himself entirely from the theology and in assuming an attitude of aloofness to it. Galileo might declare that, whatever the results of his investigations in physics might be, they had nothing to do with the Bible. But he, sorrowfully, found that the Inquisition thought otherwise. Copernicus found that uh, his astronomical theories came into conflict with church dogma, and he was tormented by his bishop. Kepler spent his later years in a deadly struggle with both Protestantism and Catholicism. Bacon and Hobbes lived in a country where their personal safety was fairly secure. Nevertheless, Bacon disguised his position by using large words, and Hobbes was untroubled because he accepted the religion of his sovereign. If the position of those was difficult who tried to keep themselves strictly within the limits of science, how much more fraught with personal danger was the position of those who openly constructed a new metaphysics? It would mean that a challenge was issued to the old scholasticism by the same human reason that had already championed, challenged and overthrown the old science. The group of men who did this were the rationalists. The rationalists were interested in science, but they were more interested in the metaphysical problems that science aroused. The human reason had been successful in the reconstruction of physics by the use of mathematics. Why should it not also be able to reconstruct metaphysics and set it to upon a mathematical basis? The leaders of this school were Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz and the occasionalists, Melenbranche and Galunx. The rationalists advanced a new conception not only of nature, but of God, new theories not only of the human body, but of the soul. Their task was the dangerous one of bravely invading the hitherto impregnable realms of the spirit. The task of the rationalists was rendered the more difficult because, for the first time in the history of European thought, the inner and outer worlds had been completely sundered. For the first time do we meet with a clear-cut and positive dualism. The history of the growth of this dualism had been a long one, and to it the Greek sophist, the Stoic, and the Christian had each contributed his share. However, Galileo and his fellow scientists in this period of the Renaissance had so reconstructed the old world of nature that it had become irreconcilable to the world of grace. These scientists believed that nature must be made to explain itself. Its events must be conceived as necessitated, its processes as having the inevitableness of a machine. From the revolutions of the planets to the circulation of the blood, the movements of nature can be measured. The law of nature that is conceived to underline all this science is mechanical causation. The researches of the scientists of the Renaissance had yielded a rich world of brute, inevitable, and scientific facts, and these stood in absolute fundamental contrast to the world of spiritual facts which were embodied in the church dogma. Apparently, the problem of reconciling the world of nature and the world of grace had been solved by St. Thomas Aquinas in medieval times. Now, however, the world of nature had been so reconstructed that the question was reopened. How is the new world of nature to be brought into harmonious relation with that old, persistent, and settled dogma of the Church? 
How can the newly conceived mechanism of nature be harmonized with the realm of free conscious spirits without giving up the conception of God as a rational being, and also without depriving the soul of its power of initiation? The new science had therefore made it especially difficult, on the one hand, to reconcile a mechanical universe with an omnipotent God, and on the other, to reconcile the mechanical human body with the free soul. The struggle of the Renaissance with the Middle Ages is therefore concentrated in the development of the doctrine of this rationalist school. It is studied here even better by the reading of two periods side by side, the rationalism, the scholasticism of the Middle Ages, and the science of the, Rena of the Renaissance meet. Rationalism was a new science, but it was a new theology as well. It was a new scholastic philosophy, for while the rationalists thought that they were given the death blow, the medieval philosophy, they were instead only replacing it with another scholasticism. In their attempt, by means of the mechanical theory, to get an absolute system of knowledge upon which thought can rest, the rationalists were acting in the spirit of schoolmen. In fact, no schoolman ever showed more vigor or more dogmatic confidence in his philosophy. To the mathematical eye of the rationalists, there was absolutely nothing mysterious in the physical universe or in the spiritual realm. All things in heaven and earth could be made clear. The declaration of the rationalists was the call of freedom, but it was as hazardous as it was ambitious and the Church in its assured revelations always stood opposed to the realization of freedom. So we shall find Descartes spending his whole life trying to trim his sails that he may not offend the Inquisition, Spinoza saving himself from both the Jews and the Christians by living in obscurity and publishing nothing, Leibniz constructing philosophy with the avowed purpose of reconciling science and religion. The mental conflict in Descartes, the strife between the spirit of the Middle Ages and that of the Renaissance, appears in Descartes more strikingly than in any other thinker of his time. He shows, on the one hand, all the conservatism of a churchman of medieval time and in his respect for institutional authority, on the other hand, his intellectual activity places him among the leading scientists of the Renaissance. In no other thinker does the conflict between the old and new appear so unsettling. In none does the antagonism between the scholastic world of spiritual things and the mechanical world of science appear so irreconcilable. He suffered a, long, a lifelong mental strife, for within himself medievalism and science were engaged in an unending dramatic struggle. The philosophy of Descartes was a compromise between his traditions and his scientific genius, and his philosophy never overcame his conflicting motives. The admirers of Descartes have called him the father of modern thought, and this is partly true. The father of the modern scientific method was Galileo. Descartes, on the other hand, pointed out the incontestable principle from which the modern thought was preceded. He won his place in the history of philosophy by attempting to harmonize the old scholasticism with the new science under this single principle.